From the Columbia University Language Resource Center, this is Said and Done, the podcast about languages and the people who speak them. This is Said and Done. I'm Chris Kaiser, and joining me is Odi Gonzalez, who is a professor at NYU who specializes in Andean culture and the Quechua language, in addition to being a writer and poet. In this conversation, he discusses growing up in Peru speaking both Spanish and Quechua. He shows how Quechua, which is more properly called Runasimi, is a precise language because it is largely a spoken language rather than a written one. He illustrates this precision with several examples and discusses the challenges of translating written texts from other languages into Quechua. Here's my conversation with Odi Gonzalez. Professor Odi Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining me today. You're the Clinical Associate Professor in Andean Studies at NYU, and you work on Quechua language and culture. So thank you for coming all the way up from NYU to Columbia. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks to you, Chris. So I wanted to just ask a little bit about your background where did you grow up and what languages did you speak while you were growing up? Yeah, actually I was born in Peru, in the southern region of Peru, in the Andes, more precisely in Cusco, in the region called Sacred Valley, Valle Sagrado. And I was starting speaking simultaneously the Quechua language and the Spanish language. It is probably the condition of all the mestizo people in in this region, especially in Cusco. All of us, we are bilingual. Since we are kids, we speak both languages. We mix, is a mixture of language and of course, a mixture of cultures as right, well. Right, right. Yeah. So these two languages that you spoke growing up, were there different context in which you spoke one over the other? Maybe you spoke one at home and the other somewhere else? Or were they fully mixed and intermixed? In school, I received the education exclusively in Spanish. Sometimes, even the teachers, they uh, used to speak Quechua, but the education officially is in Spanish. I learned Quechua very well at home. And in the street, in the interaction with, with people. Now, in Quechua, there are exact, precise terms that Spanish doesn't have. For example, when I was a kid, if, if you want to insult someone, you can find in Quechua <laughs> the exact word. <laughs> right, okay. Or if you want to say something very beautiful to a, to a girl, yeah. Quechua has the terms. Has so, that, yeah. right. So in that sense, did you feel that you preferred to speak Quechua over Spanish? How, what, what is your feeling about one over the other? Or do you feel equally comfortable and enjoying speaking one and, and the other? Actually, I never separate this language since I am a mestizo, I am a bilingual. I cannot fragment these two cultures, these two languages, of course. Even in my country, it depends on the context in which you are uh, reacting, you are talking with people. But usually, even if I am here at, uh, at New York, I speak in English or in Spanish, but I am thinking in, in Quechua as well. So I okay. cannot separate one from the other. So it's like a continuum. Continuum, yeah, okay. definitely. And there is uh, something something else that I would like to cite sure. is I am a writer, so I have conscience of my language, of my culture, even if I write in Spanish or I write in Quechua or in both languages, or a mixture of languages, I cannot separate, actually. Even the, if you were to write in Spanish, it would be in some way informed by your knowledge of Quechua. Yeah, well. definitely. For example, I can write in Spanish, but the topic is related absolutely with the Andean world. There's a word you used a few times that I have a sense of, but I'm not exactly sure what it means. You said mestizo. 
mestizo ya is and the people like me that we are bilinguals. We belong to two cultures. Okay. I have a half of Andean and I have a half of Spanish culture. No, that is the mestizo. Okay, yeah. yeah. So where, where you were growing up, what was the status of a mestizo person? What did that identity mean in that context? I think the basic mother that you can distinguish is is the the language, the bilingual. Of course, there are uh, some issues like if you can read or not, if you are illiterate, comes from your origin. But usually the mestizo people can read normally, can speak in two languages. Okay, so the meaning of that word in as you describe it is largely a linguistic meaning. Yeah, you. linguistic yeah. and socially I mean uh, I we can mention because we are not similar to the white people, for example, in my country. Mm -hmm. huh? That is. Right. We and are in the middle. Okay, <laughs> I see. <laughs> I gotcha. Like that, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have a, a... I know about Quechua. I know that it's a, a language or maybe even a language family. But I was wondering, could you sort of describe for me and for, for the people who might be listening, you know, what, what is Quechua? What, what is this language? And can you just give a, a little okay, introduction? Of yeah. course. Uh, Quechua is actually a conjunction of many variants. Quechua is a group of many variants, Quechua variants. Mm -hmm. Since pre-Columbian times, the Quechua language has spread and diversified in the Andean region of South America. There are an estimated 10 million Quechua speakers in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, and in some regions in Argentina, we'll say Santiago del Estero, Jujuy, in Colombia, in the Pasto region, and in Chile, the uh, Rio Maule region. The name Quechua, and consequently the name uh, Quechua language, is wrong. <laughs> okay. It was a historical mistake. Actually, Quechua refers to a geographical area. Quechua derives from the word Quechua, that means a temperate valley. But what we called Quechua, the native people called Runasimi, which means language of people. How Runasimi becomes Quechua? Because in the 16th century, the first written dictionary was called Diccionario Quechua, but his author, the Spaniard priest Domingo de Santo Tomás, was not talking about the name of the language. He was mm. talking about the region. But that is very important because of the hegemony of the writing over the orality is the reason why Arunasimi becomes Quechua. If you go right now to the Andean communities, it's Arunasimi, not Quechua. Okay, so... And then if I were to ask you, what is the name of your language? You would also say Runasimi. Runasimi. Okay. That is the language of people. Yeah. So let me make sure I've understood this right. There was a dictionary compiled and it was called Dictionary, Quechua Dictionary. Quechua Dictionary, but because it's... But that just meant the it valley. It is the hegemony of place. the writing. <laughs> yeah. <now>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Was there a writing system in place in, in Quechua? It's not a writing system as okay. we know the writing system, mm -hmm. the, the Western writing system. But the Inca culture, they used to register all the data, the census, for example. They have what we call the kipu, that is a kind of device of the memory. This system is made out of knots, uh, okay. and it is completely different. Sure. That it, it has a volume, it has a color, 
uh, you can smell that that is completely different <laughs> okay. so i think it's wrong to say it is a writing system okay but so, however when spaniards arrived they was at the beginning very impressed with this but later during the process of the mission they related to the demons or <laughs> devils okay and they burn almost everything um not yeah. only that they killed the people who knew how to use that it's probably the most smart intelligent people of the inca empire that is why now we still have a lot of, of these materials that nobody can read so what does a kipu look like? Is it a, a sheet or is it a, a long string? I'm not quite sure how it physically exists. It's strings okay. with different colors, with knots. That is very important. With, with knots, at first look, it looks like a, like a, a weeping now. Right. <laughs> but, right. Uh, but it's beautifully... Uh, but the Quechua language, that is very important. The Quechua language has two words to interpret this kipu. One verb is to count, to account numbers, quantities. That is the verb uh, yupai. yupai. The other verb is referred to the narrative, the verb huillai. So if the language has two verbs, very uh, differentiated one from, from the other, it means that the kipu not only was to register the numbers or census or statistics, it was as well to tell us stories, narratives. That is my theory. In, in your idea, and I'm, I believe it, the language itself gives you an interpretive hint for, for the kipu. The language re registers that it was that the kipu was interpreted both as numbers and as narrative. Yeah, probably the, there were two kinds of interpreters. However, in my opinion, I was in Mexico several times and always the people ask me, what about the, the kipu? But I mean that, in my opinion, the kipu has that structure of an oral narrative. Like you can, if you want to analyze that, you can analyze like a, like an oral narrative. That is in my opinion. But if you are going to consider like a writing system, that is different. There is a big difference between two codes, orality and yeah. writing. Right. That is for so, sure. <laughs> so, so maybe the kipu is a kind of crystallization of an oral tale or tradition. Whereas, absolutely. Yeah. yeah okay. Absolutely. In Quechua, for example, we don't have what in other languages you say, I think, for example, doesn't exist in Quechua. Why? In Quechua exists, I say, but that I say means I say what I previously thought. So there is a tendency to the concrete action, not the abstraction. That is very important in Quechua. That is the nature of, of its orality, I think. What is the reason for that, do you think? Why is there this tendency towards the concrete rather than the abstract? Because it was a society uh, I think it was in general for uh, for native culture, for native uh, language, is they are absolutely concrete. They, for example, the Quechua, 95% of his vocabulary, Quechua is made of, of uh, what we call the performative verbs. So we don't use concepts in Quechua, we don't use abstractions, we don't use rhetorical expression. For example, in Quechua there is no I am sorry or something like that. If you want to say 
the word agreement, for example. The agreement in Quechua is just to talk. Yeah. When you say yesterday we got an agreement, yeah. what really <laughs> you <laughs> were doing, it was talking. Yeah, that's true. So, that's right? True. Uh, when you want to say, for example, the construction Thai care, mm -hmm. Thai in Quechua is to watch uh, carefully someone or something. That is, in Quechua, we don't even have thanks. Why? Because it doesn't mean that it's very important. It doesn't mean that Andean people are ungrateful or rude or unpolite. No, definitely not. We have a cultural category called reciprocity. It means the reciprocity, the Andean reciprocity means one action is reciprocal with another action. For example, if you give me a piece of bread, that is an action. I cannot be reciprocal with you with uh, saying thank you because your action is not reciprocal with my rhetorical expression. The reciprocity is one action with another action. However, in Quechua we have a word, it is uh, yupaychani, but yupaychani doesn't mean actually thanks, it means later or tomorrow I reciprocate you with another action, but now in this moment take my word that is you by chance. So it's a Take promise. into account. Yeah. yeah. So if if I give you a piece of bread, mm -hmm. then there would be the sense that you would or should give me something. Absolutely. That is a reciprocity. And does it have to be bread or can it be something else? Whatever, be, bananas okay. or whatever. Okay, okay. But it's the action. Yeah. Not, not the rhetorical expression, right. that is. But if you are if you have nothing right now, you say, I will give you something exactly. but, tomorrow. Exactly. But yeah. you are giving your word because the action is coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that I is. understand. Not right now, yeah. but uh, that, that's it. So really the kind of semantic locus is on the actions that you perform and not necessarily the internal thought that drives the action because the the action speaks for itself. It indicates. Absolutely, yeah. of course, yeah. It's, it's a culture of concrete actions even the philosophy, that is very important. The Quechua philosophy, what we call in Spanish los saberes, the knowledge, is not expressive through what we call syllogism or prepositions or conclusions that belongs to the Western philosophy. The Quechua philosophy is expressive every day in the action, in the interaction in, in a market, in a plant, in a, in a, at home, every day. You cannot find the Quechua philosophy in speech. Right. It is in the action. Uh -huh. That I is see. very important. That is the concrete, again, the opposition between concrete and abstract. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the language itself, how the language works, its structure, some of the challenges that your students encounter when they study the language. Yeah, of course. Quechua is an oral language. That is the most important aspect. As I said, Quechua is a language with a tendency to concrete actions. We have, for example, in Quechua, two levels, two stages of language. These stages are the ritual okay. stage of language and the ordinary state of language. For example, if you say amaru, the word, the term amaru, amaru, amaru it, it belongs to the ritual level, to the ritual stage. Amaru refers to the mythical serpent. It refers to deities, gods, lineages, ancestors. And in the other level, in the ordinary level, we have the word machahuay. Machahuay refers only to the animal, the 
common snake. So we have two different words to refer to almost the same thing, but it is not. Actually, there are a <laughs> big difference. So it means that these two words are not synonyms. These two words uh, are not interchangeable terms. And with this point, I, I would like to say something that is very important. Quechua is because of its nature, because of its precise character. Quechua is a language without synonyms. I think all the oral language doesn't have synonyms. The synonyms come from writing code, not from orality code. So Quechua doesn't have synonyms. What it has is exact words, exact expressions. But how? And it is very important because of the concrete form of suffix. The suffix in Quechua is the potency of, of the language. For example, we have a lot of actions activities that we share with animals. If you, for example, refer the action of give birth, in Quechua we have the word wachai. Wachai is to refer to the animal action. An animal giving birth. Exactly. Okay. But when you want to refer to the action of a woman, the mm -hmm. human beings, you must add a suffix. The suffix is called ku, the suffix ku, ku. I, in my classes, I called this suffix the suffix of human condition. Oh, wow. So oh. you can cite wachakui. Another example is this, hispai. Hispai refers to urinate. So when you refer the action of the animal, you say hispai. But okay. if you want to refer the action <laughs> of human being, yes. you have to add the suffix ku. And the verb, the complete verb is hispakui. And what does mean this suffix in this action related to the human being? It means the suffix remarks that human being is the only one who has consciousness about the action, uh, this kind of action. The human being is the only one who have awareness, who okay. have consciousness about the private actions and the public okay. actions, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. right? Yeah. The, the dog, my dog, can pee, urinate wherever he please. Right. But with the human beings, you cannot do that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. There is a restaurant or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even though you might want to. <laughs> yeah. That is, yeah. But however, that is very, very important and make a big difference with the other language, I think. This kind of suffix uh, uh, marks a big, remarks a big difference. Right. For example, there is another uh, interesting example related with the verb to die. That is another action mm -hmm. that we share with the animals. When you want to refer to the death of a dog or an animal, just you, you use the word wanyui. But if you want to refer to the death of my father, of, 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 of a human being, General, you must add, in this case, the suffix pu. This suffix uh, we call uh, the regressivo pu okay. because it remarks a return. Uh, Usually, okay. this, this suffix works in what we call the motion verbs, the verbs that imply movement, mm -hmm. displacement. But how? How is with the verb to die? To die is really a, a motion verb. 
Absolutely. So in the Andean cosmogony, yes, it is. How? And this is my explanation. If I said my father died yesterday, this suffix pu means that only my father knows notions about death. Only my father knows that he is a mortal. He has a conscious. Only he knows that the death in the Andean world is a transit. It is not the end of your life. So after after death, you are going to reach other worlds. So suffix pu mark this transit, this notion of transit. But of course, my little dot, he he doesn't know this notion, right? So it's a it, the suffix marks a transition, a movement, but also a consciousness of that movement. Is is that right? Both, of course. Both. Okay, yeah, okay, both, yeah. I understand. But especially. The suffix marks more clearly that transition to the other worlds. Yeah. No. So I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned earlier, and I think it will connect to what you're saying now about life and death and the, the continuity between them. You mentioned, and you gave the example of a snake, and you uh -huh. said that there's one word in everyday language for a snake, and there's another word in ritual register of the language for yeah. a snake. So what are the circumstances in which you would use one register of the language? And what are the circumstances in which you would use the, the ritual register of, of the language? It depends on the context in which you are interact, no? definitely. Uh, for example, if you want to, as an oral narrator, for example, mm -hmm. if you want to describe a ritual and you want to describe a ceremony in which the people is uh, chewing coca leaves, for example, you have to use the appropriate term. And by the way, I want to say something related to this verb. Quechua has four verbs to describe the action of chewing coca leaves. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Four. Wow. Four barrels. And you said the same action. You said catch was very precise. So what precise. are these four but verbs? I am going to describe. You. Yeah, yeah. The first one is the verb halpai. Halpai means the action refers the action of chewing coca leaves in your break, in way of all your daily work of your daily labor. That we can say, it, okay, it is the ordinary verb. However, we have another verb, pichai. Pichai is the verb that refers to the action of chewing coca leaves in ceremonies and rituals. So it means we have the second stage of language. The third one is akuli. It means the same action, but it refers to the nutrition, the nutritive of, of coca leaves and yeah. related as well to the health, how health you can feel chewing coca leaves. Yeah. And the last one is chakchai. Chakchai is an onomatopoeic term. It reproduces the sounds mm. of chak, chak, chak. Yeah, yeah. True. The Andean ear uh, listen in this way the action of chewing coca leaves. So we have, as I told you, four verbs to describe this action, but they are not synonyms. Right. Right? It is complete. Okay, refers the same action, but from that different perspectives, that it. They are not uh, synonyms. They are not interchangeable. You could only see them as a synonym if you're coming at it from a different perspective. If Absolutely. you are saying, okay, I have the word chu in my language, so these four words mean chu, but from a perspective of a Quechua speaker, they're totally different things. 
And that is, that is right? just, you can attribute, that is the precision of wing. That is a big difference with Spanish, with English. There are very general languages. As a, as a curiosity, what is the reason why one choose co coca leaves? Because, that is a good question, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say this in United Nations or to the DIA, no? this, <laughs> this institution <laughs> who, which burned in my country the coca plantations. Why the Quechua language gave four verbs to this verb? Because it's part of the Andean human being. The coca leaves is like a medicine. It is the sacred plant. So it is absolutely important for the Andean people. What happens when you chew, you chew a coca leaf? How do you feel? You feel very active. You feel very lucid, I think. It's a part of your, of your, that your body needs or something. Mm. Probably here, the other part of the American is Coca-Cola. Okay, for us, it's the coca leaves. No? Yeah, yeah. It is inseparable from us. This is, is, is a, is a matter it's a cultural matter, actually. Right, right, right. Yeah, that is, no? So it's, chewing coca leaves is, is built into the actions of everyday life, I guess. Absolutely, okay. of course. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges that you experience in translating Quechua, because you're a, a, a writer and a translator in addition to your role at NYU. So what are some of the, the challenges that, that you faced in, in doing this? Yeah, of course. I would like to say some concrete about translation. The translation of any text into oral Quechua language implies a double challenge. It must be addressed to two recipients, the Quechua reader and the Quechua listener. However, the great challenge of the Quechua translator is to configure a single speech understandable by the Quechua reader and the Quechua listener. You cannot ignore that a large number of Quechua speakers, of especially the native Quechua speakers, are illiterate. They, many of them, will not be able to read, but they can listen if someone reads for them in their language. Not only listen, understand if they listen, if someone reads to them, uh, they can not only listen, they can understand. And there is here a conflict between the orality and writing, between these two codes. Most people don't consider this difference, this kind of opposition. That is why, for example, we have in Peru the translation of the Quixote into Quechua. That is a, a really important work and relevant work. However, there are, there are a lot of mistakes since the very title, the very beginning, because the translator uh, didn't consider these two stages of the language, I mean the oral code and the writing, writing code. When you translate into Quechua, how do you make sure that you're translating in a way that it can be listened to in the best way? How do you keep that imperative in, in mind? Firstly, the translation in Quechua must be addressed to listeners. You must be very clear. You must use the structures with which you speak every day. So what is the process in the translation? 
the process consists of dismantling all the concepts, all the abstractions, and using only the basic, the performative verbs. That is a very hard process, but you can do it. So you're part of a community at NYU and a department at NYU that promotes the study of Quechua language and culture. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just ask you a bit about some of the ways in which you and your colleagues advance that mission. So you, you teach Quechua at NYU, language classes. Are there other classes that you teach besides that, or do you teach just the language classes? I teach not only the Quechua language and culture. Now I have a course called Anthropologia Linguistica Andina. It means the interdisciplinary study focused on the language and the cosmogony, the Andean thought. So uh, we study first in Spanish because there are a coexistence of almost six centuries between Spanish and Quechua. That is why many there are interactions, there are influences of both cultures, of both languages. That is, it is a little difficult with English because English is not the language of coexistence of Quechua. Right. It's more the Spanish. Spanish, yeah. yeah. In fact, you've also written or co-written a dictionary that is a Quechua, Spanish, and English dictionary. Yeah. We work this dictionary with two of my former students. Now they are anthropologists over seven or eight years, actually. This dictionary has 11,000 entries and uh, is an important tool for not only for my students now, it is uh, the people who want to to know something sure. about yeah, the yeah. Quechua language. Yeah. So we that's, work it. that's called Quechua Spanish English Dictionary. Yeah. Yeah, it was published here in New York. And then the department that you're a part of, the Center for, or rather, I, I guess, Center, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, has quite a few events that are centered on Quechua. It has podcasts as well. And so I wanted to say to anybody who's listening that that you can go to their website. So you can just Google CLACS, C-L-A-C-S, Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, and then Quechua. That should take you to where you need to go to get access to events, podcasts, and other, other things going on related to Quechua. Yeah, actually, we have uh, the CLACS the institution is uh, under the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. The Quechua belongs to two uh, departments. So, however, in CLAX you can find, as you said, the page in which you can find podcasts, uh, you can find materials like dictionaries or all kinds of materials, audio, image, mostly made for students. No? They, for example, interview it in Peru, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, here in New York, and they talk to native speakers. And these are some of your students, right? Yeah, yeah. And they did a podcast. Podcast about this material. And among others, uh, there is a, a group of students. Uh, they call themselves ROC. It means Runasime Outreach Committee. Uh, they promote many activities at NYU or outside campus uh, with different institutions and especially in New Jersey, here in the Bronx, where there are a lot of uh, Quechua speakers, of course, not only from Peru, it's right. mostly it's from Ecuador, okay. Ecuador and Bolivia speakers. Though my students, uh, 
uh, involved with activities with the native speakers. So in in the New York City area, there's lots of Quechua yeah, exactly. speakers. Okay. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I didn't there even are. realize there that. Yeah. yeah, great. Well, Professor Odi Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. I, I learned a lot. Thank you to you, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.